Welcome back to GEMS Podcast. I am the founder and host, Miss Genesis Amaris Kemp, and with me today is Renee Harris. And here's a bit about Renee. She is a mom of nine living in Northern California. She built Made On Skin Care after discovering that the answer to her extreme dry skin came in the form of a three ingredient hard lotion bar. She found that the secret to an effective dry skin fix meant that product one should be waterless, adding water, means adding a whole host of additives and preservatives that can irritate the skin. And two, should come could, should contain beeswax to make the smooth feeling from the bar on your skin last all day long. Now, over a decade later, her family has sold tens of thousands of bee silk lotion bars all over the world through their online store. She's also created new recipes to fix other skin issues that men, women, and children face. You can find lotion bars for dry skin, lip balm for chapped lips, emollients for eczema relief, balms for muscle soreness, and so much more. Most of the products have fewer than five ingredients and the 7,000 happy reviews on their website prove that you don't need many ingredients to fix your skin. And today we're going to build up into um, what made Renee start her business. But before we do, we're going to learn some about Bert's story. So she's had nine babies. She's done it about nine times, y'all. So (laughs) she's definitely a mother that's juggling work and home life balance. So without further ado, please welcome Renee Harris to GEMS Podcast. Thank you. It's fun to be here. I am super excited to talk to you, Renee. But before I dive into the Burt stories and your business, I want to know what's a fun fact about you that obviously my audience doesn't know, but maybe um, your community doesn't know about you. A fun fact. Okay. This is related to having nine kids. So when we bought Um, our 15 passenger van, which I think we were at about five or six kids when we decided we needed to upgrade from a minivan. We got a license plate that says KID, then there's a little space, MKR. So it's kid maker. And um, we get a lot of, and I kind of forget about that. I mean, we've been driving this van for about, oh man, probably at least 13 years now. And so I kind of forget about the fact that why are people looking at us so weird when they're passing us on the freeway? Well, it's because of that. I'm sure people are trying to peek in and count how many people we have in the van. <laughs> but anyways, that, that, and the even funnier part is that my older boys, um, that was the only automatic tra- you know, uh, car we had. We didn't have, we didn't teach them how to, you know, drive another car that was smaller. So they had to learn how to drive in this van with that license plate. So uh, talk about a little bit of embarrassing moments for teenage boys. That would be it. (laughs) That is hilarious. Mm -hmm. And when you said that, I just like, um, remember this movie, I just saw the remake of it cheaper by the dozen. Oh yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Thought about your van. I was like, Oh my gosh, it reminds me of that. (laughs) Or, um, the movie Home Alone, when they were getting ready to travel and they're like, count the heads. Yeah, (laughs) we did have to do that for a while. We would get in the van and everybody was assigned their number, like birth order number. And so it was just easier to say one, two. I mean, it's been years. We're down to only four in the house now and five are already moved out. But in for a while there, we had to do that. We never lost a kid. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. But <laughs> there's always that chance. So we would just have a number, number down as soon as we got in the van. So we made sure we didn't forget anybody. Oh, wow. Did you imagine having nine kids per day or is it just something that happened? No, not really. I mean, we didn't, we didn't come from large families, so we didn't have that. I mean, if anything, it was just when we got married, we just knew we wanted a lot of kids, but back then to me, a lot was four. Like I thought four is huge, you know? And so, um, that was like the biggest family I even knew they had four kids. And so I always thought that was a lot. And then, uh, we had our four, our first four really close in age. So my first one, um, less than two years later came number two and then came twins. So I actually had four kids, four ages, four and under for a short season. That was a bit, that's busier than it is now with, you know, with nine, with running a business. And even when we had all nine living under our roof, 
it was the busiest during that time because you're trying to just survive. So yeah, no, we didn't. We, and then after that, it was like, it's, you know, so much already, you have another one and you apply it to that, you tweak things. So yeah, I think I learned a lot that with the first four that I started to feel more comfortable. And now with my, my youngest is six, she has so many older siblings kind of have taken care of her. I mean, she, they are learning great parenting skills and they're telling us all the time, mom, dad, you're too easy on her. You need to be strict. So yeah. Nice. They always say with the younger ones, you get more lax because you've been there, done that. And it's like, you're not going to be chasing after kids anymore. I don't know how true that is, but I, um, my older siblings tell my mom that all the time. Oh, she got away with murder. And I was like, but did I though? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's true because the first, you don't know how they're going to turn out and you're trying to figure things out and you, you know, you have some examples in your life, but so for the first two, especially the first one, he would probably say, yeah, it was real. You know, you were really strict with me and he was a firstborn. So he was definitely strong-willed and all that so yeah it there is truth to that yeah but they also have more kids watching them like if I had three other parents in the room watching my my two-year-old that two-year-old would get a lot of care so when you only it's you know you as mom and maybe like a four-year-old and a two-year-old there's not a lot of eyes on that little two-year-old so you kind of have to be strict until more come along Nice. And let's talk about birth stories because there are so many myths and facts around birth and pregnancy. And I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. People tell you all the glamorous stuff, but they don't tell you like the ugly parts. Like there's a big line that goes up your belly. Um, I don't know if it's called the nativity line. I don't know if that's- Yeah, I don't even know. I've heard the navel something. I'm not really sure. Actually, I'm not even sure the term for that. Yeah. I'm not then, sure I'm going to be the expert. I should be the expert on that part. Ask me another question. <laughs> then uh, they talk about C-sections versus vaginal delivery, or now um, some people are doing the water births. Mm-hmm. Okay. What are your thoughts around those, um, those, or there's also another one besides the water birth. I think it's just a general home birth, I think. Mm-hmm. Okay. I can talk about all of that. <laughs> so first of all, everybody is different. And you, and if you haven't, you know, if you're having your first child, you don't know what to expect. You can go ask your mom how her birth, what, you know, experiences were, and maybe some will be similar to your mom. Mine wasn't. My mom said we all came, you know, there's three of us, but we came pretty fast. I have not had a fast birth yet. So everything was really slow for me. So, so knowing that everything is different, it's more that, you, you can just gain a lot of knowledge about different people's birth experience and not to get freaked out because sometimes you can get overwhelmed by, oh my goodness, this is going to go badly, or this is going to go fast, or it's going to go for three days straight. You can have so many different stories, but knowing that everybody is different, it's more just being, I think it's more of a, and this is going to work for anybody, male or female, learn how to control stress because when you're in labor, the best thing you can do is kind of know how to kind of get in touch with your body, but just know when to breathe. And there's all the different classes on that, like the Lamas. And then later on, I think I did the Bradley method with breathing techniques and so on. That gets so much easier. If you know, if you knew, for example, that you had to have a surgery and no painkillers, what are you going to do? Are you going to freeze out? Because that's going to make it worse. So you have to like, okay, I got to, I know it's going to be a lot of pain, but even there, I mean, you have options. People will can do the epidural I, so for my first two births, they were definitely just, I just, I read the traditional conventional books, what to expect when you're expecting, kind of did what everybody did. I got the epidurals on both of them and it was pretty, pretty much a a routine birth. I would say it wasn't like anything, nothing went badly. I should say everything was kind of routine, but then I got to learn more about like, I want to do a little bit more natural. And by the way, I thought, that because, you know, I had the epidural, it wasn't that painful. I thought I can handle pain. I'm pretty good at this. I can pain, no problem because you, I hadn't experienced like a lot of pain yet. And so I decided after talking with some friends who had had have, um, home births that I wanted to do that. So I had to get my husband on board because he was like, I don't know about this. And so we went and um, actually listened to a speaker who happened to be a friend of mine. And she came and spoke all about home births. And so all the husbands were there to hear her stories and had a, we had a midwife come and talk about it. And by the time we were done, we we're like, we're all doing this. This just sounds great. And sometimes it's because you hear more of the horror stories of like an epidural gone bad or a birth that you think is going to go great. And it ends up being a C-section that could have been avoided. So people have different reasons for doing a home birth. But for me, 
I just thought this, this sounds doable. Like we were created to give birth. So why can't we try to do it this way at home in a natural setting instead of the hospital? And then, um, so I thought with my third pregnancy, I'm going to do home birth. Well, I didn't know until about, I had a midwife. She was great. Same when I listened to speak and um, she kept saying, I think you need to go check to see if you are having twins because I'm hearing two heart tones. And I'm, I'm thinking, that's not twins. I, that doesn't run in my family. It doesn't, I can't, I just didn't believe her. And then I'm starting to question, like, why am I going for this? Maybe she's not even experienced to know if I'm, you know, I'm just starting to like, I'm not sure about this. So I kept putting it off until I was about six months pregnant. And she was kind of by then insisting, cause that would change her strategy if I had twins and can she actually kind of legally where we, the state we lived in, she wouldn't have been able to do it at home. So um, I went in and got the ultrasound and like right away, two heads are showing. It's like aerial view of two heads on the screen. And, us, and my husband and I are like laughing. Cause I thought there's no way. And I had a four-year-old and a two-year-old. I'm like, twin there's two in there I totally did not believe them but it was true we were having twins and then we got to find I had two boys and then we found out one of the twins was a boy and then the other one was a girl so I was finally like, yes I got my girl in there so uh, we ended up having to go she couldn't do the birth so we had to go find an OB and um, that so that story even though it wasn't a home birth I went I ended up having a c-section that uh, even though I tried to avoid a C-section, I felt like I was getting a lot of information and I felt like I knew my stuff. I was, we were kind of concerned about the way the babies were, um, were positioned. So they had to turn in order for me to have a vaginal birth. So there's all these little things along the way that had to be done. And I was trying really hard to get my body in shape to do it. And I would, I would actually go swimming and dive down to get the babies to turn the right way. I mean, just all these little strategies or lay upside down. There's just all kinds of techniques and stuff. And then a little bit after they turned, I think they were about 36 weeks. I was kind of just feeling a little bit sick. And I thought, I want to go see if they've turned yet. I'm going to go into the hospital and check. And uh, my OB doctor was there. She said, yeah, I can check. And then she goes, oh, you're in active labor right now. We need to get these babies out tonight. So I thought active labor, I did not feel it. I did not feel any kind of contractions or anything. And remember, I'd never felt like pain before because I had the epidural. So I just figured like, I am superwoman. I don't feel any kind of pain. <laughs> so they did the C-section and unfortunately, because they were not quite 37 weeks, they had to be on oxygen. So I had to take, they were in the hospital for a week and I had them on oxygen when we got home. So it was, it was, a and I had two little kids at home too. So after that, I thought, I don't want to go through a C-section again. So, uh, but in that state, you have to have C-section. The next one has to be a C-section if the first, if you ever had one. So now I'm like, okay, all of my babies are going to have to be a C-section if we have more kids. So anyway, long story short, um, we were able to have the next one as a home birth, totally successful. I felt what pain feels like, but I felt like super in tune with, I know how this works. So even though it was, you know, you go through labor, you know what you're doing and you, and you feel like you've got the strategies and techniques and, and yeah, it hurts. And yes, you know, all the stuff, but it was a totally different experience in the hospital. So I went on to have, um, how many is that? What am I on? Five, six, seven. I think it was three more um, home births after that. Two, three, yeah. And then the, my, my last one who I just had six years ago, she ended up having to be a C-section because we had some complications halfway through that we knew about that the, my midwife said, no, you need to go to the hospital for this one. So she ended up being a C-section. But um, so that's what I've kind of had them all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Experience. So yeah. you're definitely an expert in it. So <laughs> vaginal, C-section, home births. Um, so with the home births, Renee, what, like, whenever you were feeling the pain, was it the breathing that helped you mitigate the pain that you were feeling? Yeah, it's, it's like just getting, like trying to, like, if you tense up, it feels more painful. It's hard. Mm -hmm. So instead, just kind of like, okay, it's coming on. You can start, it starts to roll a little bit where it's coming on slowly. And then you get to this height, like the pain is getting more and more and more intense. And instead of like getting tense with it, which makes it worse, you just think, okay, I'm just going to relax. I'm going to think about things. And sometimes you have to get your mind off it. For me, it was just like, okay, I'm going to watch a movie. I don't want anybody talking to me. I like the room dark. You just kind of set the atmosphere to be in as relaxed of a state as you can. I did the, um, the birth tub too. And on one of them for me, it's which I loved, but it slowed down my labor. So some people, if they're in that much pain, 
getting into the warm tub actually helps a lot. And some people will actually give birth in a tub uh, and that's totally fine, normal. And it's probably really good, a healthy way to do it. For me, I would slow down my labor and I'm like, but I got, I got to sleep a little bit, like a half an hour nap in, even though I was contracting, it was a lot more doable. So it's more that you get yourself in the most comfortable, relaxed, um, whether it's music for some people, for me, it had to be a distraction. So we were just watching movies and my husband was just rubbing my back. Cause there's sometimes there's the back pain and you just want a good back rub. Or if you have like a massager, just put that on wherever the pain is. All of those just techniques kind of help with that. Wow. Oh my gosh. It's just so much to like take in and digest. And then I know you mentioned swimming and um, diving. I, so I wanted to go back swimming, but I just was not sure. Like, you know, whenever, like whenever you first start motherhood, there's a lot of things that you wean off because you want to make sure that you have a safe and healthy delivery. So did you consult with your physician uh, prior to going swimming or did you say, yeah. you know, Okay. <laughs> and swimming, it was fine. And I mean, for every person, I would just say, ask your doctor or your midwife, but swimming is so healthy. And it doesn't mean you have to build, you know, your breathing really hard or anything like that, but just relaxing to me, I think it's great. I mean, the baby is kind of living in a pool anyway. So for me, I just felt like swimming was good squatting, like just, you know, if you can get used to doing a lot of squats, it's so much more comfortable to be able to give birth in a more of a squatting position or sitting up than it is traditional in the hospital where you're flat on your back. I mean, trying to push something out when you're flat on your back is really hard, but if you've got gravity working for you, and I remember when I was um, pregnant with my number five, I was outside, it was actually raining outside, but I just sat there and did squats because I wanted that baby to go just head down there, just keep going, just push that gravity down. <laughs> but it really helped a lot too. So I would like, at, you know, if, if somebody's like it, any trimester really, but just do get those leg muscles going and, and squats are great. Yeah, I've heard that. And there's um, some pr um, pregnancy exercise videos on YouTube where a lot of them will incorporate squats and just open up that pelvic area. But now that we kind of know a little bit more about birthing stories and uh, from your perspective, Renee, so once you um, safely delivered all nine of your Bambinos, how was it juggling work on top of being a wife? Because you had a lot going on with those kids. Yeah, and we didn't... At that time, we didn't have the business going at all. So that wasn't in the picture. Um, we were, and then we even had kids after we had the business going. So as far as like busyness with the business before the business, I had like my, my background was, uh, I was a high school teacher for several years before starting to have kids. And then I kind of carried that into doing some night teaching like adult school. And then um, by the time number two came along, I just completely quit that altogether and uh, didn't go back to work at all. And then we started the business when we had, um, right, well, it was about a year before we had our eighth child. So we have nine, but when she was born, actually when she was born was about the time that we were transitioning into making the, um, the home business a full-time business. And my husband was gonna end his job to do that. So it was kind of a busy transition there. And a lot of it was, I kind of already by, I mean, obviously by the time you have two kids, you've got things figured out, you know, three kids, you get things figured out. So those routines were kind of already in place by the time I started a business. Um, but it, I, the one thing I tell people is like, you don't, ha I didn't have nine kids all at once. So it's not like I figured it all out in one day. <laughs> so they come a little bit at a time. And I remember when I had just two and they were really young and people would say, oh, you must be so busy. And I would look around and say, well, everybody is busy. They're just busy differently. You know, I feel like everybody is, and we homeschool the kids even from the beginning. So that part has been easier because they're at home with us and they, um, some of them are actually actively part of the business. So all of these little things, they don't come all at once. So I know some people can have like a big life change happen all at once and you have to get through that. But even with pregnancy, you kind of know, you, you know, especially with my last one, when I knew I was having a C-section, I had to transition and change up so many things I was doing in the business because I knew I'd be bedridden and I couldn't get up and do things. So I had a few weeks to put my systems in place to figure out uh, who's doing what. And I think what makes our family different too than a lot of families is you're in survival mode. So when I had twins and I was potty training my second one, I had to have as much help from my four-year-old as I could. So he's used to helping out, like go get mom water or get the phone or, you know, just like little things that 
some you know, parents don't, unless they have to, have to, have to, they may not think about training their kids on those things, but when you have to, they learn young. And, and our kids are, have told us that like, oh, I'm glad we had to do laundry when we were eight years old, because now I know how to do laundry. You know? So a lot of those things you can't, that mom can't do it all. There's just no way. And so you just decide what kinds of things can the other kids in the family help. And they feel good about that. They know that they're participating and it's all in how you communicate with them and say, hey, you are a big part. You are a big help to me. Like my six-year-old, I'll say, hey, could you, just before I came on with you, I say, could you get me a big glass of water? I'm going to be thirsty. And so she was happy to do it because she knew that she was helping me. And then she comes back and I'm like, oh, you are so glad. I'm glad you didn't let anybody else in because it's got to be quiet in here. So you did a good job now. Keep everybody out while I'm on the phone. So, you know, those little jobs, it's kind of how you communicate to the kids too. That is awesome. That's like, she's your gatekeeper. Mommy's busy, so you can't go in there. Right. Um, and, and she's the is, one that would interrupt me the most. So I knew I had to get her on board first to see, you know, she would be the one that would probably bar. I could tell the other kids out. I'm going to be on a call, just be quiet, blah, blah, blah. And, and, you know, trying to get that six-year-old to be quiet is easier if she knows, oh, it's really important. And I'm going to make sure you keep everybody else quiet. And I bet she's out there making sure everybody's quiet. <laughs> so. so why the name made on for your business that, okay, so first of all, the, what the business is, is that I've always had um, problems with my, my fingers and like the, you, the cracks you get in your heels from walking barefoot and my fingers would get those cracks and splits and, and my knuckles would just like start to bleed. And it's, I mean, I don't know if it's just me because I'm raising kids, I'm constantly washing my hands, but I remember that even as a high school or just walking around barefoot in hot Northern California my, my heels would split and we always lived in dry climates. We lived in Colorado for a while. So it was the same kind of thing there. And so what, first of all, before getting to the name, um, I had tried everything, like any kind of band-aids were always on my hands, but then you wash your hands and you have to reapply them. And I would put lotions on, but they don't stay in the skin long enough. And so um, I finally had a, I was into doing a lot of like bread baking, which also killed my hands because of the salt, but I would, a lot of like homemaking type things. And then I learned how to make soap and I kind of got into that. And then I heard about this thing called a lotion bar. And I thought, well, it's lotion. That's different. Why is it a bar? And so, but then I kept hearing that that is really what helps the, the dry skin, the cracks and the splits. And so I Googled and found in this like remote little soap form, a whole bunch of recipes for lotion bars. I, I'm going to try and make that. Well, it sounds easy enough. If it's like soap, it's, it turns out it was way e easier than soap even to make. And so I found one that was like the easiest, like three ingredients. I knew I could get it at my local health food store. So I bought it, brought it home. I made the bars and I kid you not, it felt amazing on my skin and I couldn't believe that it felt, it could feel so good. And so I let a little bit more time go by, you know, a couple of days later, I would apply it again and it just kept feeling good. And then pretty soon the little splits and cuts were gone, like they were healed. So I just felt like this is a miracle lotion thing, you know? <laughs> and so, um, so that what we make today is that that's the same exact thing. And it's been like 13 years now. It's the same exact three ingredient bar, same recipe that I had tried way back then. So what we started to do is from there, we, a quick story is that we, we turned that into a little farmer's market stand. And I brought my boys who were eight and 10 at the time, my two oldest to come and help me sell at the farmer's market. And then I realized I love talking to people about this. And I would get like these, where we live, we have a lot of ranchers and um, just horse people and um, farmers. So they would come to the farmer's market and these big rough guys would come and my boys had their little samples and the guys would say, what is that? Cheese, I'll take some. And they're like, no, it's not cheese, don't eat it. And they would put, rub it on their skin and they would come back, they would kind of walk away and after we explained what it was, and then they would turn around and come back and buy it because they're like, whoa, this feels amazing. These big guys, you know, mechanics with all those really deep slits and cuts would come back and buy it. And I thought, this is, this is kind of a cool thing. We should try to sell this. So we did, we took it online. The name comes from, we, on every single product, we would actually write, we would sign the date that it was made on. So that was the name made on. And we got that idea from the sea salt that my husband, he grew up in France and his mom would send us this um, sea salt from Provence. And that's what they would do with the sea salt. They would sign it on the bottom of the sea salt container. So anyway, we thought, what a cool idea. And then we came up with a name made on. So that was, 
that's it. That we can't do that anymore now. We could, but we found after about eight years that people would say, "Is this the expiration date?" And it's like, "No, no, no. It's it's all fresh. You know, it is. This is. It's just important for us to know that this is all in handcrafted in small batches. It's the, the date that it, it was made on, and you still have a good six months to two. Usually, it's two years. I mean, you actually have a long, long shelf life with it. But uh, we didn't want to confuse people, so but we kept the name because we thought it was cool. <laughs> That is super, super cool. And I could definitely resonate with like the crack heels. I'm in Texas. So like certain times when the weather changes and we have like very horrendous humidity here, mm -hmm. like my heels would crack. And so like, I was like, well, I'm not walking barefoot. So I don't know what it is. So I've just been like, okay, let me hydrate and all this stuff. And my sister started like making some of her own skincare products because she had a little bit of like skin poems. I'm not sure if it's... Uh, like, eczema? like not eczema I guess the lotus marks where like mm -hmm. some parts of your skin were like lighter than others okay. and only my older sister and my dad had that but then once she changed her diet like she became a vegan and different stuff like her skin started clearing up plus with like the products that she started making for herself and I just never had that problem. My problem was like acne and like mm -hmm. face care and stuff. And I'm like, oh my gosh, Brittany's skin is just glowy. I just want that smooth skin. Like, cause she never really had problems with her skin. It was just like her chest area with like the liver splotches. I guess that's what they're okay, called. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. liver splotches and some on her back. But then uh, when she got pregnant, she had these um, horrendous stretch marks. They were like so dark and black, like my glasses. And she's like, what is going on? So I know like uh, when you talked about your lotion bar, they said when, whenever you're pregnant, you should make sure your body is just like very hydrated and lotioned up. So have you seen any, um, any pregnant women who have just been buying the lotion bars by the bulk to help with like... <laughs> With the pregnancies, yeah, you know, cocoa butter is really good for that. And so one of the bars that we make actually has cocoa butter in it. And so that's, that's what I usually recommend for stretch marks, because that's what they say is great for stretch marks. And I, I think really, even the regular ones that we make, a lot of them, uh, we, we make one, the one thing about the cocoa bar is it's made with cocoa butter. So it smells just like chocolate. So some people are like, they love that. And then other people are like, I don't want to smell like chocolate. And plus, for some reason, dogs are attracted to chocolate. It's not good for them. So sometimes we've had customers say, well, my dog ate my lotion bar. And so, <laughs> and that's because of that smell of cocoa. But um, so cocoa butter is good for stretch marks. And that we do have a lotion bar that has cocoa butter in it. And the rest of them that we have is with shea butter. But shea butter, I love because it's so good on all kinds of different skin conditions. And we have, because of the, it only has three ingredients in the bar, that's why we get a lot of our customers come to us because of the different allergies. And people are now, you know, suddenly allergic to just all kinds of stuff that is in traditional lotion. And it's also because they have a lot of additives. Once you put water in a product, you have to have preservatives and additives, and then they add fragrance oils to it. So all each one of those little additions can be something that's gonna aggravate the skin and make it worse. And then on top of that, if you're allergic to a certain food and that that oil, or you know, let's say it was peanut oil, I don't know that products are really made with peanut oil, but even almond oil, if you're allergic to almonds, you can sometimes can't use a skincare item that has almond oil in it, which is in a lot of stuff. So even something that you eat that you're allergic to, um, even though you not, might not be eating that, there's a lot of people that come to us because they have to watch that ingredient listing so closely and they know they're safe with beeswax and shea butter and coconut oil. So they're fine with that and they'll order because it's simple. Those ingredients are super simple. So yeah, it's, it's one of those things that it, it's, it's amazing how much what you eat and a lot of lifestyle things affect the skin. So it's not even just what you eat, but stress. A lot of people will break out if they're under stress or I had somebody I talked to recently that massive rash. And she finally attributed that to her, to stress. And it wasn't even that it was all that bad, bad stress, but it was, it would trigger every time she was in a stressful situation, she would start to break out in a rash. So it's, there are just a lot of little things like that, that um, trigger it hormonally. Yeah. Same thing. And I'm, I'm kind of going through that perimenopause now. So I can even tell, I can tell when I'm extra dry or, you know, breakouts in my face, it's just the hormonal changes that happen. So yeah. 
And that's really cool just to hear that there's only three ingredients because I love the store Lush, but then my sister had to tell me, even though they say they're all natural, do you know all the ingredients that are in the Lush products? And I was like, that's really, that's, you know, really yeah. cool. But I was like, I guess I'm just not like that health nut, but I'm getting there, um, especially as I learned more and figured out that I had different types of allergies and stuff mm -hmm. like that. It forces you to change your um, lifestyle. And I'm just so glad that we got to talk about the bird stories, but also made on skincare. And Renee, as we wind down, I want you to leave the listeners and viewers with your call to action for this segment. Well, I would love, you know, I, I know because I was that person that had such a big struggle with my own skin that to have a solution it was amazing. Like I wouldn't, I never even thought about starting a business, but because we figured out there are so many other people that are suffering and it doesn't have to be like that. And this is such a simple solution. And in the beginning of the business, I was teaching people how to make the product so they could, I'm like, I wanted everybody just make it. There's a solution for you. <laughs> And so even, even then with uh, one thing, something else that we even started to, since we're talking babies, and I noticed that my, my own son who had a baby rash when he was like four months old, I was looking at the desitin and realizing, oh, the 17% is zinc oxide. I knew all about zinc oxide already. So I started making a rash cream because it, and that only has three, and we sell it now that only has three ingredients and that's just beeswax and um, coconut oil and zinc oxide. And that's all you need. And now you have a rash cream that's just as effective as, as desitin without the fishy smell. So if I have some free samples on our website. So if anybody wants to go to hardlotion.com and then look for the little part, hard lotion is easy to remember. We also decided to not name it made on, but to name it hard lotion because that's what it is. And that name didn't really exist back then. Lotion Bar did, but hard lotion, we were able to get that domain. It's super easy to remember. And if you find our way to our store site, just do a search. This is the easiest way to get to it. If you do a search for um, freebie, on this on the um, store site once you get to the store you'll find the page that has all these free samples we have lip balm that i highly recommend if you have a dry skin issue that the lotion bar would be the best place to start just get a sample of the lotion bar and you know what if you if you're somebody who is expecting a baby or you have a baby in the house just leave me a note in the comments and I'll add something for babies because I, I really, I'm so excited when people obviously, cause we have nine, I'm excited for that journey. And I know it can be, it's a ton of work. I have older kids now and it's, it's so much more enjoyable too on the other end. And I almost wish I could have enjoyed those. I did. I totally enjoyed it, but have more of those moments of just like gazing into these little baby's eyes. I'm kind of, when I see other people with babies, it's like, can I just hold that baby? <laughs> So I want to, you know, those of you who are in that state of life, I know it's a lot of work or, you know, that, that, um, I would just love to bless people in that way too. So just say that you found us through this show and we'll, we'll take care of you. Thank you so much, Renee. And now I want you to um, tell the listeners how they could connect with you on social media and all of your contact information will definitely be in the show notes. Okay. Yeah. And we're on on um, Instagram, everything is pretty much at hard lotion. So if you go to Instagram, it's at hard lotion. If you go to Facebook, it's at hard lotion, even TikTok. Oh my goodness. My teenagers are probably embarrassed to see me on TikTok, but we're sort of trying to figure out how to be a presence there. So come follow me on TikTok. So you can navigate those waters with me while I figure it out. You definitely have to do some of those dance reels. Apparently I heard that they go like semi-viral when you do those but Renee I want to thank you so much for being a guest today and listeners and viewers make sure you subscribe and share we are on 40 plus platforms also follow us on YouTube at gems with Genesis Amaris Kemp for all video content and for those of you who want to feel generous please um, you could donate or become a brand sponsor for the podcast all the information can be found at genesisamariskemp.net and until we chat next time peace love and lots of blessings remember go try a new product because your skin will feel amazing <laughs> and you will love it so until next time, ciao.